Do you? 
that only comes from you. We thank you most of all for that gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and what that means for our lives today. The hope that it gives us not just for today and not just for tomorrow, but forevermore. We thank you that you adopted us as your children. And now we pray today that we embrace you and you alone as our Father. The one who gives us all things, the one who's created all things, the one who promises all things. We pray today that you would speak loudly to our hearts and to our lives as we look at your word. That you would guide us, direct us into your truth. And that we might come to know more of what it means that you are a father today. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please let us know. Talk to one of me or another part of our leadership team just so we can be sure that we are thinking of everything and solving all the problems or, or, or uh, thinking of all the things that sometimes we don't think about as we we'll meet next week to just kind of discuss where we're at and, and some plans moving forward. So if you have anything to contribute to that, please share that with us this week and, uh, as, as we prayerfully seek God's wisdom in that. I was uh, reading this article from the New York Times. And it was written by a, uh, a young man who lives in New York City. He's a, a former soldier who served in Afghanistan. And he was writing about how in 2017, he had his first son. And he was writing about the day his son was born, the day he became a father. And on that day, he said he was standing there in, in their room and his wife, his new mom, was sleeping, recovering from delivery, and he was holding his newborn son for the first time. And those of you who've had that experience know what that feels like, the, the joy that's there, how you, you can't understand how quickly that you love something that much that you just met, and the hope that you have for their lives from that point forward. So he's filled with those kind of emotions, and at the same time, that day, there was a bombing in London, the London Bridge bombing, and it killed eight people, injured many others. So as he's holding his newborn son for the first time, his eyes are fixed on the TV screen as the news over and over again is playing about this bombing and the people who died. And so he has this, this confusion, these mixed emotions, the joy of holding his son and the fear of the world that that son's gonna have to live in, right? And so his fatherly instincts kick in right away. And he whispers into his newborn son's ear, it won't always be like this. Fast forward, when he's writing the article, just a, a month or so ago, and the town he lives in is the epicenter of a global pandemic. His son's now almost three. And now his son every day is asking him, Daddy, when can I go back to school? He's in daycare, but called it school. When can I go see my teachers? When can I see my friends? And his dad could give the only answer that anybody had, I don't know. But eventually, he said, his son's questions changed from when to why. Why can't I go to school? Why can't I see my friends? Why can't I see my teacher? And he didn't know how to explain a virus like this to his two-year-old. So he said, eventually I had to give him an answer, and I gave him the only answer I could think of, and I said, it's the world. Because of the world, you can't go out. And his son said, well, I want to hit the world. 
pretty good American reaction, isn't it? <laughs> we get a problem, somebody does something to us, we hit it. It makes us feel better. It doesn't work, right? It doesn't change anything. And he began to think about that and he thought back. He thought of all the times over the last weeks where his son had heard the millionth ambulance go by their house. And how he would start just weeping and crying for the sick people. How all this had made him face the PTSD that he realized he had from his time in war. And the struggles that he was going through. He wrote of how he was going to have to answer those questions for his son one day. With better answers than he had now about war and what it was like to fight like that. And he realized this. He thought about all those things. And that bombing. And this virus. And, and war. And he realized how foolish he was in those first moments as a father. He said, I realized I can't promise my son that it won't always be like this. We want to, as parents, right? We want to protect our children. We want to shield them from harm. We want to tell them it's not always going to be like this. It's okay. It'll get better. But we don't know that. Because we don't control that, do we? We want to believe that ourselves. But what we come to realize in life is that tomorrow is one of the impossibilities that we face. We're not in control of it. We can't change it even when it arrives. It's totally outside of our reach. We don't know whether tomorrow will be better, or worse, the same. We don't know anything about it. We can't promise anyone it won't always be like this. Because it might. We're going to look at this passage today. The story is in Mark chapter 5 and in Luke chapter 8. We're going to look at Luke chapter 8. And it's about a dad named Jairus. And Jairus has a daughter, his only daughter, and she's dying. He's facing this impossibility of tomorrow in her life. It's not like she's sick. And she's going to die. She's dying. She's on her deathbed. These are her last moments. He knows tomorrow is an impossibility for her. We began to talk last week about how we serve a God. We live for a God who said, since when has impossible ever stopped? A God who can do the impossible. And so as we begin to look at these passages where God does just that. I wanted to look at Jairus on this Father's Day. Because it, it reminds us of sometimes we want to do the impossible in the lives of the people that we love. It's not just about us. It's not just about what we face. It's not just about what we want. We want to be able to tell our kids, our neighbors, our loved ones, our parents. It's not always going to be like this. But Jairus can't tell his daughter that. There's only one thing Jairus can do. And that's take his daughter to Jesus. And it's only then that he's able to face the impossibility of tomorrow. And only then that he's able to, to be able to promise his daughter that it can't always, won't always be like this. So I want you to, to look at this passage with me again, Luke chapter 8. And as we look at it, we're going to look at both what Jairus does here. But more importantly, Jairus' heart the attitude that we see in him as he comes to Jesus. And because we all have brought people to Jesus. We all have prayed for people like this or begged to God to, to work in people's lives. But what we're going to find is we don't always come like Jairus does. And it's the heart he comes with that allows him to see God work in his life the way that he does. So start in verse 40. Chapter 8, the Gospel of Luke. It says, on the other side of the lake, the crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. Then a man named Jairus, a leader in the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. As Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. So let's just pause there. Jesus has just crossed the lake. The crowds here is coming, and they're there waiting for him. Jairus is not the only person showing up to get Jesus to do something in their lives. But Jairus comes to Jesus and says, my daughter's dying. I have an immediate, desperate need 
that needs fixed right now. And if it's not fixed right now, nobody's ever going to be able to do anything about it. And so Jesus goes with Jairus. Now, Jairus, it tells us, is a synagogue leader. That's an elected position. It is a position with prestige. He would have been well known. Perhaps he had heard Jesus teach in his synagogue. Perhaps he just heard everybody else talk about him. Perhaps he had even seen Jesus do something great already. We don't know how Jairus knows of Jesus. We don't know what Jairus knows of Jesus. But what we do know is Jairus has realized Jesus is the only one who can help his daughter. He's literally leaving his daughter in the last moments of his life. Imagine that, leaving your child on their deathbed. Because he recognizes that only in coming to Jesus and only in bringing Jesus to his daughter is there any hope for her to have any possibility of tomorrow. Now that might seem like an easy thing to do. We might say, well, that's easy. Somebody who's dying, surely I would pray for them. But I want you to understand, there's a couple things here. Number one, Jairus is risking something. Jairus, as a leader in the synagogue, Jairus, as this elected official, he has a position of prestige that if the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the other synagogue leaders found out that he was coming to Jesus, if they found out that he was he trusted in Jesus, and when they found out that Jesus did something, I mean, how many times does Jesus heal somebody and then that person gets accused of things, right? If, when Jairus gets found out, he's risking everything he's ever worked for. The possibility that they say, you can't have this position anymore. You can't be this leader anymore. You can't do this anymore. He's risking everything. But he has to. Because either he risks everything, or he risks not doing what his daughter needs. And what it comes down to is this. Jairus doesn't care what those other people think about him coming to Jesus. He cares more about finding his daughter what she needs. What keeps us from bringing people to Jesus? It is, it's simple. We don't have to fight crowds to do it. We can do it wherever we are, whenever we want. But what keeps us from doing it more? Sometimes we face this obstacle that People might think something badly of us. People might look down on us. People might think or say things that insult us or put us down. Maybe we even risk something. Maybe there's parts of the world where going to Jesus isn't okay, like it is here. There are things that stand in our way that are keeping us from that. But we have to begin to adopt that attitude of Jericho where we say, we don't care what the world thinks anymore. We don't care what the world has to say about that. What we care about is the people that we love finding the hope they need in Jesus Christ. That has to matter more than anything else. But it's how Jairus does it. Not just what he does, but how he does it that matters. So I want you to look at some of the qualities. Number one, Jairus comes humbly. We already read this. When he shows up, when he sees Jesus, what does he do? He falls on his knees right in front of Jesus. That is a position of humility. Jairus could say, I am the synagogue leader. I need you, Jesus. I demand that you come and follow me. He could come pridefully and think that because of who he was, he could demand things of Jesus. But kneeling is a sign of respect. Kneeling is you saying, you are greater than I am. You deserve honor from me. And so Jairus approaches Jesus humbly. And sometimes it is our pride that's keeping us from coming to Jesus in the right way. It's our pride that causes us sometimes to demand things of God. To tell Him what He's going to do in our lives. It's our pride that makes us think that we can fix the problems and we don't need God to do it. I don't know what it is that causes us to think that, but we do. We've all fallen into that trap. And if we want Jesus to come work in our lives and the lives of people we love, we have to humble ourselves. Secondly, we see that Jairus comes patiently. We kept reading, and we're not going to read these five verses today, 
We're going to read them next week. In verse 43. The, the story of this woman who was bleeding and been bleeding for years. Uh, she reaches out and touches uh, Jesus' robe. It's a story we know pretty well, but I don't think we realize that she touches Jesus' robe while Jairus is leading Jesus to his house to heal his daughter. So if we know the story, the woman touches Jesus, she gets healed, Jesus stops and says, hey, somebody touched me. Peter says, Jesus, there's 8 million people around you. Of course somebody touched you. And Jesus says, I want to know who it was. And they say, that's impossible. But Jesus stops until he finds the woman. And then he brings her out from the crowd and he has this conversation with her and he changes her life. He works the impossible in her life too. We'll look at that next week. But what if you were Jairus when that happened? Your daughter's on her deathbed. Jesus is following you to your house to save her life. And Jesus stops to find somebody who touched his robe. And then he stops and has a conversation with the woman. Would any of us think badly of Jairus if he says, Hey, Jesus, she's not dying. We can come back and talk to her later. How about we deal with my problem first? Hey, Jesus, let's go to my daughter. The woman can follow us. Let's talk on the way, right? <laughs> Keep it moving. He doesn't do that. While his daughter is dying, he waits on Jesus to work in somebody else's life. Patience is required when we humbly come to Jesus and ask for him to work in the lives of people we love. It might be the hardest part of it all for us. But we don't get to tell God how to work. We also don't get to tell God when to work. We wait for not just patience. We see that Jairus has perseverance. We'll read the next verses in a moment, but two things. One, it tells us that the crowds, and we read in verse 42, the crowds were surrounding them. The word Luke uses, Luke uses means they were choking them. The crowd was so tight, they were choking in on them. Imagine that feeling, somebody grabbing your neck and taking your breath away. That's how the crowds felt to them. They couldn't make it through. They, the crowds were this obstacle that was keeping Jairus from getting Jesus to his daughter. Not only that, as Jesus is talking to this woman, healing her, what happens? Jairus' daughter dies. So the next verse tells us. They show up and say, your daughter's dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Those are obstacles, aren't they? The last one, a pretty considerable obstacle. That could keep Jairus from continuing to bring Jesus to his daughter. He could say, the crowds are too thick, we're never going to make it, I quit. She's dead. There's no point anymore, I quit. See, there's things that happen in the lives of the people that we love that often cause us to stop, to quit going to God on their behalf. That cause us to lose hope that cause us to give up, that cause us to lose sight of why we came to Jesus and Him alone in the first place. To get Jesus to work in the lives of people you love requires perseverance. It causes endurance. It's not something that you fall on your knees once and then you just get to sit back and wait. Watch. No. It's going to take work on you. You know, there's never a passage in Scripture where people come to God and they ask for Him to do the impossible. And when it's done, they say, and thou sayest, that was easy. Never happens, right? They all have to work for it. They all have to do something. They all face these trials, these obstacles that they have to push through. The same is true in your life. And if you keep giving up before you give God the chance to work, you won't see Him work. But none of those are the most important quality. The most important quality Jairus has, listen as we look in verse 49. 
while Jairus, or Jesus was speaking to the woman, a messenger arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. He told them, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But when Jesus heard what had happened, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith and she will be healed. The most important quality that Jairus brings with him is faith. Because when they say your daughter's dead, humility and patience and perseverance, they can't touch that. See, we can have humility and patience and perseverance when there's hope. But when things become hopeless, the only thing that can stare that in the face and cause us to keep moving is faith. Faith is the only thing that causes us to continue to trust in what is impossible. Because they haven't put a comma on this sentence, have they? They put a period. She's dead. It's over. There's no point. And Jesus says to him, don't be afraid of death. Don't be afraid of what they've said. Just have faith. Jesus is saying to them, don't let the impossible keep you from trusting in me. Don't let the impossible keep you from bringing me to your daughter. Don't let the impossible stop you from hoping and trusting in what I can do in her life. And here's what we see. Faith works. It works in their lives. Because if we continue to read, it says, when they arrived at the house, Jesus wouldn't anyone go in with him except Peter, John, James, and the little girl's father and mother. The house was filled with people weeping and wailing. But he said, stop the weeping. She isn't dead. She's only asleep. But the crowds laughed at him because they all knew she had died. And Jesus took her by the hand and said in a loud voice, my child, get up. And at that moment, her life returned and she immediately stood up. And Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were overwhelmed. But Jesus insisted that they not tell anyone what had happened. When they get there, the house is filled with mourners. This is not family that's crying over the loss of this daughter. These are professional mourners. They would hire people to come in and mourn in your house. So what that means is this. These people, their job every day, they left their house, they grabbed their lunchbox, and they went to somebody else's house where there was a dead person. And they would sit in that house with that dead person and they would scream and wail and mourn so everybody could hear and know about the death that had happened. And every time, every single one of them went to work each day and they showed up and there was a dead person for them to mourn, guess what? When they went home, guess what? It was still true. There was all That never changed. These people saw death every single day. And so when Jesus comes in and says she's not dead, when he brings Jairus in and says, don't be afraid of this death, have faith, what do they do? They laugh. Because that's impossible. They've seen death every single day. And nothing and no one has ever been able to change it. Until Jesus showed up. They're laughing at Jesus. And indeed, the world laughs at the, the idea that Jesus can do these things in our lives that he promises to do. No, they're not just laughing at Jesus, are they? They're also laughing at Jairus. They're laughing at Jairus at this idea of why would you continue this charade? Why would you continue to bother to bring Jesus in after your daughter has died? But Jairus doesn't listen to the voices of the world around him. He doesn't listen to those laughing in the face of his faith. He continues to trust. And because of that, his daughter lived. Because when we, we put the impossible into the hands of Jesus, when the world laughs and we face it with faith, God can do great things. God can do things in our lives that we can't believe that anyone can ever do. That little girl lived for one reason. That little girl lived because her father had enough faith to put her life in the hands of Jesus. Her father had enough humility to grasp that he couldn't fix her life. He needs somebody greater than himself to do it. His, her father had enough patience to wait 
and say, Jesus is going to do this whenever he does it. His father had enough perseverance to push through the obstacles that the world put in his way. His father had enough faith to trust that Jesus could do the impossible because of what her father did. She lived. So I want to finish today. I want to challenge you with this. I want you to imagine that you're Jairus for a moment. Because we've all been Jairus. Right? Whether you're father or not. We've all had somebody in our lives, maybe it's even ourselves, who faces a hopeless situation, who's stuck in something that they can't get out of. That we think there's no way it can ever change. There's no way we can fix it. It's a problem too great for us to handle. And most of us, if not all of us, have done what Jairus did at the beginning, and we brought that person, we brought that problem to Jesus. And you're thinking right now, I've been here and I've done this, and it didn't work. So here's what I want you to imagine. Imagine that you're Jairus. Imagine you've fallen there at the feet of Jesus. What do you say? What did you ask him? Think back. What were the questions that you asked to God when you brought somebody like this daughter to, to God in prayer? Because I know some of the questions. And if you really think about the question, if you can imagine yourself saying something like this, I want you to think about what it says about your heart. Imagine that you fall in front of him and you say, why? God, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to them? Why are you allowing this, God? Why did you do this? Those are not humble questions. Those are private questions. They're questions that make us believe that God has to explain himself to us. They're the questions that Job asked God, that finally God had enough of and said, were you there when I made the world? Were you there when I hung the moon and stars? Who do you think you are coming and asking these things of me? Where he tells him, if, if I could explain it to you, you couldn't understand it. Who do we think we are that we can ask God these questions of why when we can't understand why? When, God, when are you going to finally do what I've asked you to do? Why haven't you done it already? How long, O oh Lord? How long? Those are impatient questions, aren't they? They're questions saying, God, it's been long enough. I've been patient, and now I'm done waiting. It's been long enough, it's time for you to do something. It requires patience, and that's not patience. Or imagine that you come and you say, why is this so hard, God? Why do I have to go through much pain and suffering before you work in my life? Why do I have to face these struggles? Why do I have to face these hardships? Why do I still have this problem? Those are not questions of perseverance or endurance. Those are questions that have said, I've, I've given up and I'm done working on this. You know, what we find is this. Sometimes, here's Jairus, especially with his patience. He's leading Jesus to his house. You're going to face obstacles. You're going to face hardships. You're going to face all that. But in his humility and in his patience and in his perseverance, here's what happens. Some woman that he's never met before, that he's never seen before, that he's never heard of before, because Jairus is on this journey with Jesus, Jesus crosses her path and her life is changed. Because sometimes on the journey of what God is doing in your life, He's got other things to do on the way. 
And if you just keep trusting and believing that he's working, he's going to lead you to the place that you can look back and you can say, look at all that God did. Not just what I asked, but there were things he did I didn't even know to ask. There were people's lives he changed that I didn't even know needed help. But if you're not humble enough to ask in the beginning, if you're not patient enough to wait on him, if you're not willing to push through all the obstacles, you'll never see that. Not because God can't do it. But because you haven't had the heart that allows Him to do it in your life. So I want to finish today by challenging you to be like Jairus. I want you to think of what what problem, what obstacle that you need to bring to Jesus today. Maybe you recognize you've been bringing it, but you haven't been humble or patient or enduring. And I would especially challenge you fathers to take this moment on this Father's Day to humbly come to God on your knees and bring your children to Him. Because all of our kids need Him. They all face the impossible right now. No matter how young or old they are. I challenge you to do it at the altar and open it up to you. But I want all of us I'm going to sing a song in a moment that I just want you to, to just be in prayer while I sing it. And the song just talks of how deep the Father's love is for us. How much He loves us. And if we recognize how much He loves us, we recognize I don't have to be great enough to get that love. I don't have to wait on that love. I don't have to do anything to get that love. That love is with me on that journey. He's taking me. We can't understand why or how deep that that love is, but it's there. So as we sing that, I challenge you to prayerfully come to God. Humbly, patient, enduring, with faith. And ask for God to work and do the impossible in your life and in the lives of those you love. Because if we do that, we find that God will do things that the world says can't be done. Trust in Him for that today. Let's go to Him and pray.